Hello and welcome everyone. And today we have Eva with us who will be talking about is your workflow close minded and engineering approach to finding research insights with a classical tool. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone again. And we pass it on to Eva for her to take over. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Appreciate that. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, just to get started a little bit about me. Um, so I am a user research lead and currently working at McKinsey and Company in the technology and digital space. Um, I've also been uh, mentoring on ADP list since about June of last year. Uh, so likely if you have been one of my mentees, you've seen at least one of these faces in the circle here, helping you and inspiring you hopefully, um, I hope. Um, so my career started as an industrial and systems engineer and I transitioned into user research. Um, I've worked in the industries for about 20 plus years. I will let you figure out what the plus is um, and how many years are in that, but uh, I've worked with engineering work design. I've worked in operations research, analytics, process optimization. I was a UX designer for some time and now a user researcher. Um, I do have this affinity towards learning sciences. It's very interesting to me, so I'm moving towards that as well. Uh, my experience uh, has spanned over quite a few industries, but the primary ones that you see are uh, manufacturing, hospital healthcare, entertainment and TV networks, as well as technology and software. So uh, that's a lot. Um, so let's get through the legal part for me. So before we start, I just have to say, uh, the content in this presentation is all about my personal opinion and my current uh, career experiences. Uh, I also want to make sure that you understand it's not necessarily associated with the McKinsey and Company uh, patterns. All right. So just to ensure that we are all level set on certain terms, um, let's quickly talk about what it means to be closed minded. Okay. So traditionally, when you hear the word closed-minded, you think of people, um, hence the definition, having or showing rigid opinions or a narrow outlook. And this is just a Google search. Anybody can go and look and see that. So you've seen people like this, right? Um, they get very comfortable in this space. Um, they think about things only in one way. They're not necessarily open to different perspectives. And right now you probably are hopefully thinking of someone maybe in your home life or work life that is uh, showing those characteristics. And those typically aren't things that you want to be. So when we apply that and think about that for our workflows in respect to you know, thinking about workflows as a tool, they're tools and sources to identify opportunities. So it becomes really critical to make sure that you don't fall into those same patterns of closed mindedness when you're, when you're creating these workflows. Workflows are meant to collect data in an easy, digestible, and shareable fashion. So if we're not careful, um, we may close our minds to some undiscovered information in our workflows. So what do we wanna do? We wanna ask ourselves, am I creating workflows that block me from seeing other perspectives? So that narrow outlook uh, am I limiting myself because of what I was taught versus capturing experiences? So that would be sort of those rigid opinions. And then am I creating workflows that miss insights and business values? So as researchers, we know that insights don't just pop out at you. <laughs> there's, there's work that you have to do to get to them. We have to bring together pretty much what this quote says in the corner here, our head and heart knowledge just to get there. Um, and the workflow is simply just one way to begin to break that down. Okay, so hopefully you are now at least level set on what we mean by closed-minded. But for the rest of this session, we're gonna talk about a few things here to help you understand how you can use this um, to better your insights. Um, so we're gonna just go back and look at what was the original purpose of the workflow or flow chart. Um, we also are gonna seek to understand how methods of the workflow creation can impact outcomes. And then we're gonna illustrate how we can apply that thinking in our work lives. And if there's time after that, we will do a little Q and A. 
Okay, so hopefully you all are on board. Okay, so in the title of the talk, you may have noticed that I put the word classic tool. I said that because this workflow tool has been around for some time. In today's experience, we have prescribed and crafted ways of understanding user flow that may come and go, but yet this one just seems to remain at the core. When we consider the origin of this, I personally think of an engineering discipline. So flow charts have just always been around in you know, data collection strategy. I've said that before. Um, they were formally introduced in the early 1920s. Um, the founders of what we call management science, which is often called industrial engineering, used them for manufacturing production. Um, flow charts were historically used to really just decompose movements and tasks in search of ways to be more cost effective when they're producing products at mass. So just to help reiterate this a little bit, I'm gonna have you watch a video, it's just a couple minutes long, um, just to get a sense of how things were back when it first, the ideas first started. The Industrial Revolution paved the way for a tectonic shift in the way industry derives value from products. Efficient systems of creating marketable products meant that the method of production was a source of significant value. More and more, the way a product was created was becoming a product in and of itself. Naturally, companies began to take ownership and attempted to improve methods of production in order to maximize value. We find out how the machines and tools and the methods of using them should be changed to make it easier for the operator. This shift in the way companies derive value led to the creation of the management consulting industry. Led by Frederick Winslow Taylor, management consultants in the late 1800s and early 1900s were some of the first to apply the scientific method to management practices in an attempt to improve industrial efficiency. Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, contemporaries with F.W. Taylor, adopted, promoted, and expanded on his work. While Taylor and the Gilbreths were frequent collaborators, they were also competitors and had disagreements over issues ranging from methodology to billing practices. While Taylor's work tended to focus on the time elements of efficiency, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth are best known for their pioneering work in the field of motion study. Using motion pictures to record human tasks, they developed a system of behavioral units describing motions. This system of behavioral units was dubbed Thurblix, which is simply Gilbreth spelled backward with a TH transposed. The Gilbreths defined Thurblix as 18 essential motions a worker can perform. As management consultants, they filmed laborers performing repetitive tasks and analyzed the recordings. They applied their system of Thurblix to reduce unnecessary movements and created optimized methods for performing tasks, maximizing productivity, and minimizing fatigue. More production equals more work in my language. Yet you claim it'll make jobs easier and still get results. Sure, a man can produce more without working a bit harder. It's going to be hard to make some of the boys understand that. The work of Lillian and Frank Gilbreth has been influential across multiple industries. The methodology for analyzing motion to improve efficiency has been applied at military units, hospitals, commercial offices, and manufacturing plants. The early fatigue studies conducted by the Gilbreths led to the development of ergonomics as a way of improving productivity. They developed some of the earliest methods of accommodating persons with disabilities, and they are credited with introducing the first surgical nurses to the operating room. They also designed and promoted the blindfolded teardown of firearms used by the military. In a world where everything from manufacturing to logistics are becoming increasingly automated, the Gilbert's methods of increasing efficiency will continue to have influence in all of our organizations for many years to come. Okay, so that video he is a little bit older, but I think you get the point. Um, if you think about it, these machines were the software of their day. They took processes, they observed them, they streamlined them, they rid them of defects, all for a more satisfying, well, at least a less fatigued experience um, that helped them in the business. So software today essentially mimics those same concepts. People, humans have tasks to complete and software makes it possible for them to do that easily 
and continues to sustain the use of the workflow by practitioners all over the world. Okay. So some may say that, you know, this is outdated, Ava. You know, it's outdated now, nobody's doing it. But no doubt the world has evolved into using data, analytics, data science. Um, this is present all around us, but guess what? We are still human. And the human says, let's revisit it. So let's take a look at a couple of quotes here. Um, one's from Engineering Management Sciences from 1948, and one is from Cognitive Science in 2014. Um, the basics of this says, on the engineering side, tasks could be broken down into micro movements based on what was physically possible for a human being. Then when we look at the cognitive science side, it gets a little bit more detailed. It's one of the main points is we can understand a complex task and the cognitive system performing it by breaking it down into hierarchy of more basic subtasks and associated subsystems. And then it goes on to say, powerful tool for understanding many different aspects of mind and cognition. So these, these thoughts were about 75, a little over 75 years apart, um, yet there are things that still remain about us because we are human. How our brains learn and how our brain handles tasks is a fundamental effort. So that, that gets us thinking a little bit. You know, during discovery, as a researcher, we want to understand the user's activity. We're working hard to frame the problem. We're listening, we're looking for patterns, we're seeking if there's variety in their styles of working, we're trying to sort out what comes natural for the user so we can understand it, and we're trying to find opportunities that we can measure. We do this by, as you know, uh, doing observations, we do interviews, we do task analysis, a host of methods that you may use in your current role. But what about the pain points or issues that users don't tell you about or even know to tell you about? So this brings up the point, could the way you create your workflow be hiding insights? So we've all seen these workflows. I grabbed these from Google, commercial free. <laughs> Um, we've seen all, a variety of these things. You might work with people who give them to you for evaluation, or you might create flows like this yourself. It gets the job done, right? However, an important step to reiterate is how we build workflows could likely be causing us to lose insights and in business value. So you might ask after all that, yes, I get that, but what is the problem? So if we combine the thinking of the engineering world and even the cognitive science world, we start to realize that there are often workflows, flowcharts that skip human thinking and some behavioral actions. Um, these actions impact how, it may, how long it may take a person to complete a task or activity. And this knowledge could potentially lead to us discovering an unknown insight. So at this moment, you might be thinking to yourself, we, we got the journey map. The journey map covers all of this. It, it has task, it has experience. I know within the step what task is acting. I know what's a value add. I know what's a value detractor. I've got this. Why do we need to go this far? Well, when you think about it, you have to ask, ask yourself, do you really have it all? You know, that row of actions within the map, they may be enough to satisfy your teams to move forward, but does it cover all that it can for your exploration, perhaps even a deeper exploration? Maybe you're working with a mobile app and these actions are more important to you, or maybe you're designing something in the physical space and you need to know more about the embodied interactions. Okay. So to test this out, I'd like us to try a little experiment. Um, so this image, this flow chart is, a, is popular on the internet. Um, so we're gonna imagine that we've been given this flow chart um, to repair a lamp, so a lamp repair process. So if I read this as is, you know, I start with somehow knowing the lamp doesn't work. And if I, I'm then being asked if the lamp is plugged in, 
If no, then I'd plug it in. And then if yes, that it, then I check to see if the bulb is burnt out. And if yes, I replace the bulb. And if no, I repair the lamp. Now, in many cases on, on your teams, your whole team, the other developers, engineers, product managers might say, okay, we're good. Thank you. Check the box. You, you're doing well for the sprint <laughs> and we move on. But you are researchers and designers. Your curiosity should be kicking in when you see something like this. Okay. So let's do a little bit more into this exercise here. So I'm going to ask you to do this in the chat. But when you look in the flow, at this flow, what is missing? Does this workflow set you up to discover insights? And will this workflow strongly support your journey map actions? So in the chat, if we could just take a few seconds, who's over here, and let's type what you think is missing. What's, what steps would you add? Let's see if I can see anyone. Adding any? Make sure they're not in the question answer section. Okay, so I see one here about verifying if the lamp works. Absolutely. <laughs> Did you pay your bill? Love that one. <laughs> Did you pay your bill? Let's see, let's, let me go ahead. I'm gonna add a few here. Oh, that zoomed pretty good. So verify, yeah, verify if ramp. Make sure I get this. Works after plugging in. Got pay your bill. They're starting to come in now. Let's see, they're going too fast. Check the lamp manual. <laughs> manual, let's see, is the outlet working? Perfect. Cord broken. Forgive me if I'm skipping yours, it's just uh, moving quick, quickly. But I think, I think you're, we're getting the point. I also see the wires are old. Check if the lamp works in a different socket, replacement of the light bulb, uh, check the cord, press the right button, test for the switch. Exactly. So you all are on point. So I performed this experiment a little bit also with some others, and some came up with some similar things, right? Someone said, did you jiggle the bulb? Was it screwed, it, screwed in? Check the power outage, kind of similar to uh, the about part about, did you pay your bill? Um, testing it after repair, there was nothing there for that. You know, making sure, is there a switch that you have to flip on? I see, get a new lamp. <laughs> Don't have a bulb handy. Is the bulb too bright? That's a different, interesting thing because maybe you think it doesn't work because for some reason it's way too bright. Um, is it the wrong wattage? Um, and this was an interesting one. You know, maybe it's a modern lamp. Was it facing the wrong direction and you just didn't know that it, that's how it's supposed to work? So all of these things that you mentioned, you know, were missing in that workflow. And in, it stops you from getting to at least potential insights um, that you couldn't see. Because everything you said, whether you think it's far-fetched or not, is an important thing to recognize. So even in this simplified flow, it's probable that your more complex mapping is skipping steps two or either bundled all into one process box. OK. So earlier we talked about the mind and cognition, how it played a part into breaking down tasks and the importance of that. And I know you just did this exercise and found a few more activities that others might do. But what other activities did we miss that also could provide information for insights and patterns and behavior? So if we focus just on this part right here where we're talking about the lamp being plugged in, what other human behaviors occurred? So this is just a random set. Of course, it doesn't represent all of the tasks or mental models, but these things in the dotted line are things that could be thoughts. Someone actually noticing that the light was off. Someone, you know, let's say they, they're gonna plug it in, 
but they actually in their mind think I have to decide to lean, to lean, to plug it in. I actually didn't have to actually lean to plug it in. Maybe they're deciding to just plug in the lamp and they're positioning their eyes on an outlet or they decide they want to bend, bend over to grab a plug. Maybe it's on the floor and I have to decide to bend to do that. Same thing with grasping a plug, things like that. These are the, these are the elements that when you saw that old engineering video and they were handling those uh, tiny bits, these are the things that engineers cared about because there's certain sets of times that are humanly possible to do things. And so they use that information to add up costs, to add up time and, and measure productivity. But you can see there's a whole host of things that could be added related to behaviors themselves. Okay. So think about it in this way. You know, when you look at these steps, are these steps impacting the user's experience? Yes, they are. Are these steps impacting how long it takes to complete the task? Yes, they are. So what if our persona had a wide spectrum? So for instance, imagine if a person bending has a knee problem. If we didn't document these and think about these in this manner, we may not uncover the fact that bending could be a strong dissatisfier for a set of users. And that, that's something that wasn't present in our first view, but now that we've kind of exposed it a bit more, we could see how that might be a problem if this is done over and over. So when we, when we do this and break this down in this way, it opens up our perspective. You know, this perspective comes from engineering and cognitive science, but when we include the actions of human thinking or the event before the decision, we, we likely have a chance of not missing the insight of why uh, and, though, and figuring out why is it unsatisfying for someone or why is it not up to par. Now, when we map without this, you can kind of look in the bottom because you're used to seeing this when people put decisions together back to back. Um, when we do that without it, we leave it open for assumptions about what's happening and likely we end up having these unidentified bottlenecks and leaving those insight starters on the table. And as researchers, we study behavior. So understanding behavior is the start of that spark that can lead us to a better understanding to help our stakeholders be more aligned with the why we we're recommending certain changes or certain process updates. So we want to move more towards a deeper understanding of the user and the experiences. We've established that, said that a few times. So now that we have more to review because we've revisited our workflows, perhaps we'll learn something you didn't know. So we can take this example of the part about noticing the light off. That wasn't in our original workflow. It's something we discovered as far as some of the thinking. Um, when we look at this, we can ask certain questions. Of course, these are just a few to start your, start your thinking, but you always want to ask why are we doing this? You know, is this a value add or detracted to the experience? What does it cost to perform this? What perceptions can you explore around noticing the light off? Can you use this to hypothesize and feed more ideation? You know, what is the magnitude of frequency that this is happening? Um, our example was just a lamp, but if this was a process that's repeatable, those things start to add up. And then what could be, what is the impact or change when it's coupled with something else that you found, right? Are there multiple users exposed to this? What data is stored and associated with it? So from this, you know, we, we may find other ways to indicate that the light failed. Maybe now it's a watch that gives you haptic feedback. Maybe it's a voice that speaks when you walk by. Maybe you put together that every time you notice the light off, something is happening in the environment at the same time. The point is that it's likely that these discussions may not have occurred to you this early in your research if you hadn't updated your approach to the workflow. So, you know, another moment of pause here, observations versus insights. Um, a new discovery like this may not be an immediate insight. You know, insights are often derived from a collection of observations or a combination of data 
with other qualitative and quantitative information. Um, they certainly can be things that maybe you didn't realize was happening, you know, things related to behavior. So, so you always want to take the moment to make sure that you're not just talking about, you know, this is an observation. You're really thinking about the why and the behavior to become an insight. But the key is don't leave the opportunity on the table. So now that your mind is no longer closed, hopefully, about workflows, what are some of the benefits of having an open-minded workflow? Well, well, let's see. So now there's likely an opportunity for you to recognize the parallels a bit more often, okay? Uh, you're, now you can have documentation that exposes user thinking and behavior in a manner that could lead you to explaining more issues and generating more ideas. And key for me, you know, when you start up with a clear understanding of your process um, and you do the work to make it more efficient before you design or automate, because if you think back to that view from before, you know, software is just a form of automating a process that a person wants to do. So if you clean that up prior to adding the software, you can potentially have less issues and less defects, which always lead to better experiences. And if you don't remember anything else about what I've said tonight uh, or today at the morning, um, remember these things. Don't be afraid to take a hybrid multidiscipline approach to problem solving. You know, we sometimes we get stuck into, well, design says we have to do this and research has to do this. But a lot of disciplines look at processes and investigate human tasks. So, and then make time for workflow analysis. You know, do we spend enough time actually breaking down those tasks, figuring out what people are actually doing and thinking to make things better? And then take this, rethink, and go back and visit, revisit some of your workflows. See what you can find, see what you can discover, um, and I hope you find that it's all worth it. So that is the end. It has been a pleasure sharing with you today. Thank you for listening so much to what's in my head. Um, and just as a reminder, although this whole presentation was reflected on my own personal experience, you can learn more about career opportunities in McKinsey's tech ecosystem, which I'm a part of, um, by heading to mckinsey.com slash TD. And I believe we have some minutes for questions. I'm gonna slide my screen over and see if I see anything. But let's see. Let's see, we have a few questions here. I don't know if my, let's make sure my host is bringing them up. Okay. So this first question, uh, is perfectionism part of a closed-minded workflow? I tend to get way too nitty gritty on designs. What other common symptoms and how to overcome it? So it's a very interesting question. I used to call myself a perfectionist all the time because I would get really detailed. Um, if you think about a lot of lean principles that came from manufacturing that are now even pushing over to UX, that idea was kind of work to perfection. Um, so you have to have a balance. So I wouldn't necessarily call perfectionism part of being closed minded. It does give a sense that you are, you know, you're curious or you want to explore deeper. But we do have to balance depending on, you know, you know, usually you're going to have a deliverable date. So there has to be a point where you say, OK, this is going to answer the question I need or this is going to help support the evidence that I'm trying to bring forth or my hypothesis. Um, so let's see, what are other common symptoms and how can you overcome it? Um, I know symptoms of, I guess, perfectionism for me was, you know, I ended up, because I cared so much, I would take too long on projects. Um, so I had to just really buckle down and focus. Um, it does help, it did help me to organize myself as far as my research plan, making sure I always put, here's my, here are my test methodology that I'm going to do and what my expected outcomes were. And so that always helped me stay focused on the goal at hand. So 
nothing wrong with really caring because that's how I look at perfectionism, but I wouldn't call it closed minded. And I think you, you can take steps to get over that. Let's see what's. How do you think, okay, how do you think the closed minded of the old times of design will show in uh, machine learning, virtuality, et cetera? How can we push against this to be more open minded and self aware? Um, so, so yes, you know, sometimes, you know, I've read things where it said, you know, that's why I had this slide there about being outdated. But the thing that I always remember is that all technology does is sort of reduce costs and uh, brings up the speed of a process. The core of what we need is always going to be someone is there. There's always a real person involved or there should be. Um, so we have to keep put that in perspective. Um, you don't, you know, disconnect to the old ways because they are sort of tried and true, um, but you can always add to. So things like machine learning, virtual reality are okay, are great, but I think in creating those things, um, you have to still come back to what is it that the user wants. And when you come back to what the user wants, now you're right back in that old time because you're talking about people. Um, you know, I've seen people in my past when back way, way back in the day when we used to do time and motion studies, like you saw on this on the video, um, you know, you could figure out how to create statistical randomness and uh, assess what the time it takes to do something. But that wasn't authentic, that had bias. Um, so you always went back to the core. What is it that they're doing? What are they trying to accomplish? How can I learn about that? Over time, machine learning, can, machine learning can help with that because you're starting to train, but it's always based on a task. It's not based on something just out of the air. You had to start with some sort of origin. Um, so to push against that and being open-minded, I think you know, being self-aware that that is where it's coming from. You know, Why are you doing these efforts? Why are you adding virtual reality? There's a person involved. And as long as that person's there, there's a, there's a process. That you can that that you can always kind of come back and tell people, look, this is how we we have to care about the user. We have to be their 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 voices sometimes when they're not there. All right, let's see. How to map a workflow without biases and predetermined flows? That's a good question. Um, so when I when I think of myself as a researcher, I consider myself a person that has to bring the truth um, to the forefront. Um, you definitely can run into uh, stakeholders, uh, managers that sort of want you to hurry and get it done. So if you focus on your goal is to document what, what's there, what you observe, what you see, um, you wanna make sure that you know your subjects that make sure things like, you know, they're fully trained on something, or at least understand if they're brand new, fully trained so you can categorize them. You wanna observe them in their space. I know with, with the remote work, that's a little bit challenging, but the, the goal is really to get the truth. And so if someone gives you this flow, like you saw some of the flows in the pictures, it's your job to take a look at that and evaluate that and compare. And, you know, not make the assumption that this is exactly how they're doing it. Because a lot of times people confuse things like user experience flow and application flow. You know, you might have a prescribed flow for how an application works, but that's not how they use it. So you have to make sure you collect information to get that difference. Because again, this is a tool for data collection. And the closer you are you, to what's really happening, the better. Um, you think about it like you think about data. I'm sure you heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out. You don't want bad data in because you get bad data out. And the same could apply to workflows. So how this works out when these days epics are broken into smaller epics. Um, so I'm assuming that you're talking about in, to, in the sprint agile world, um, how do you kind of have time to do this? Um, or if that's not correct, uh, perhaps add something to correct me. Uh, but, you know, 
the breakdown of these tasks in this in this view had purpose because we were searching for other things that people do, other behaviors so that we can address them. Uh, because regardless of what's happening, that's what the real life is. That's what people are experiencing. Um, when I think about epics from an agile perspective and you have these, these large initiatives and stories, they in a sense, you know, get broken down um, because they're supposed to represent sort of story themes. Um, but you're not the role of the workflow that I'm talking about being broken down. At some point, you know, it would support that, but you have to look at it from the perspective of what your what your focus is. So if you're if you're doing epics and you're just trying to organize what the stories are and what the users want, um, you you can't necessarily, I guess, connect the two, um, or you just have to look at it like the data that I discovered, the insights that I discovered led me to do this, and this is how you sort of break that down. Um, not certain if I'm answering your question right because I see epics and I definitely think of um, sprint processes. So let me know if that is not what you're asking. But to me, two different things, same kind of realm of thought, but it's not necessarily, I believe, to break your epics down to the minute <laughs> granularity that I'm asking for in a workflow. All right, I think that is, that are all the questions that we have. Let's see, my host is that saying. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate your comments and your participation. I hope that you now will, of course, go back and look at your workflows and see what else you can find.